Welcome to Play It By Tier, a series created by the Switch Clicks. In this series, we review a variety of games, movies, and other media, and we will be placing each of these onto a tier list based on the category. In this episode, we will be reviewing The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker for the GameCube, and its HD remaster on the Wii U. Imagine a game where you can explore an open, seamless world where you have various unique locations to visit and huge amounts of space in between to explore, all without the need for loading screens. Very few, if not any, games have managed to accomplish this sort of task. And it wasn't until the sixth generation of gaming when the concept of open world began to fully flush out. One of the games that have contributed to this concept was The Wind Waker. Despite all of the criticism this game got at launch, the game aged very well among the Zelda fanbase, even garnering a fanbase that's around the same size as Twilight Princess by the time people realized that The Wind Waker was actually a good game. Even for today's standards, I believe this game still holds up against many other action-adventure games. The gameplay takes your standard Zelda formula and throws it into a huge open world to explore. Most of the mechanics are relatively easy to learn, though I do think some of them go unused quite a lot. It's neat to have the option to use an enemy's weapon or various special fancy moves to subdue your enemy, but you're never in a good scenario to use them, and you're putting yourself more in danger whenever you go to use them. On the flip side, the use of items in this game was fantastic. Compared to most other Zelda games, many of the items in The Wind Waker actually felt relevant. They aren't just meant for solving very specific puzzles in the overworld, and they aren't just for traveling to certain parts of the world that you previously weren't able to go to. The items here are designed to be used for combat, giving you all these ways to rack materials and rupees in the game. Difficulty-wise, I think this game really presents itself to be a challenge when it comes down to thinking. You can't really be brain dead when you play this game, but it's not overly difficult until the very end. There is a bit of a spike of difficulty at certain points of the game, but for the most part, I would say this game looks much more difficult than it actually is. Hero Mode on the Wii U made it slightly more difficult, but as you progress further into the game, it feels pretty much the same thing as if you were to play normal mode, especially considering you'd probably have many overpowered items by then. Traveling in this world was one of the bigger highlights of this game, and it's because there's so much to do at every region of the map. The only problem was that traveling was painfully slow on the GameCube because of hardware limitations. You also had to constantly open the map to find out where you want to go, and if you want to change directions of where you want it to go, you have to bring out the Wind Waker, which is a fancy maestro, to conduct a theme to change the wind direction for the direction that you want to go. All that is very painful to do, especially in a world that's massive and not that easy to remember. Fortunately, there was a fast traveling system that had plenty of places to go, not that it was 100% convenient, but it definitely shaved off time from the slow traveling. Better yet, on the Wii U, the traveling was improved by a lot. Because of the Wii U's second screen, you were able to sail across the ocean while looking on your map, kind of similar to the DS games. This made the experience much more immersive. You actually felt like you were there. It really gave off a different experience than your average Zelda game. The Wii U version also added in an upgrade on the sail, which allowed you to travel faster without having to stop, play some music, and change the wind direction. The upgrade changed the wind direction to the way you wanted to go, whenever and wherever you'd like. That made the game much, much better. But when it comes to world design, there's not a whole lot to say about it other than having islands designed to be like any location in any Zelda game. The dungeons aren't too unique and feel almost like a dungeon or temple, rather than something like in Twilight Princess, where they serve as a secondary location, such as a house or a mine. The islands themselves don't actually have a lot to them, and you'll find yourself landing on each and every one of them to find treasure, only to find an area that you can't access because you have to beat a certain temple. You also get a bunch of carbon copies of each other and very similar looking islands. It gets repetitive. As for the story, it's really good. It does really well to acknowledge the events of Ocarina of Time and feel original at the same time. It doesn't feel like what you'd expect a Zelda game to feel like, yet it holds that same charm throughout its gameplay. For example, you're not going to save Zelda, the princess, damsel in distress. You're going to save your sister, who is kidnapped by Ganon. And Zelda in this game happens to be called Tetra, and she's a pirate. Plot twist. This was one of the only two times we've ever seen Zelda actually fight for once. 
The game itself puts a lot of emphasis on friendship and teamwork as opposed to your typical companionship with Navi or Fi or Binna. Link finds himself working together with many more characters in this game than any other Zelda game, where he usually is a lone hero with a guide to help him cross any place. Very few Zelda games have gone down this route, and even fewer have been considered to be mainstream. The only other Zelda games where you have this many companions would be the Hyrule Warriors games. As mentioned before, Zelda is playing a much more active fighting role rather than being that damsel in distress princess that you typically would expect her to be. This also happens to be one of the very few Zelda games where we actually get to see family members of Link, being his grandma and his younger sister. A lot of the story emphasizes on Link rescuing his sister, where in most other games, it involves rescuing his friends or Zelda. By the end of the story, you're left with wanting more. And while we didn't get that because of Twilight Princess, we did get eventually two games on the DS, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks. The music is a mix of nostalgic and memorable music that was composed to feel like an entirely different game, despite actually reusing a lot of elements from previous Zelda games. Outset Island, the place that you start off with, makes references to the Kakiri Forest from Ocarina of Time. Forest Haven, similar case, makes references to Lost Woods, also from Ocarina of Time. Windfall Island makes references to Kakariko Village from A Link to the Past. The Phantom Ganon theme makes references to Ganon's themes from both A Link to the Past and Ocarina of Time. And of course, good old dungeons, also atmospheric, except this one did it a little better than Twilight Princess, I feel, as this one has a much more calm but also unsettling vibe. Combat music. And it's repetitive. I do forget a lot about the boss themes as well, because there aren't that many memorable ones. Maybe have one or two here or there, but I probably can't list them out myself. It wasn't like I only remembered half of the Ganon themes in this game anyways. But then come the great iconic themes of this game, like the title screen of the game. Very memorable, very nostalgic, and it sets the vibe for the rest of the game. There's also the Great Sea, the music that you hear when you're traveling across the big ocean. This thing is very memorable, and you'll hear it everywhere you go, yet it doesn't get tiring at all. Dragon Roost Island is another nostalgic theme. You'll hear this a lot in Nintendo's orchestras through the anniversary celebrations. This very theme also reappeared in Breath of the Wild at Rito Village. If anything, The Wind Waker does seem to be the game that laid out the groundwork for Breath of the Wild, compared to most other Zelda games. The Korok Leaf item pretty much inspired the paraglider. The game has several materials that are dropped by enemies, and they can be used at multiple locations for various different purposes. Just like Breath of the Wild, the huge seamless ocean that you explore in The Wind Waker was taken a step further in Breath of the Wild by giving you all these different terrains and environments to explore. Said world encourages exploration, feeding special fish to add parts to your map, just like climbing the towers in Breath of the Wild. The Wind Waker was the first Zelda game where the player had the choice of not wearing the green tunic from start to finish. Heck, I might even say the champion's tunic from Breath of the Wild is similar to the lobster shirt from The Wind Waker. In the HD remaster, because of the changed textures and colors, this very same color palette was used for Breath of the Wild's art style. Looking at the beta gameplay for Breath of the Wild, the Wii U gamepad functionality in that game was originally supposed to be similar to what we saw in the Wind Waker HD. How about the two species, Crocs and Rito? Both of them were introduced in the Wind Waker, and they made their first ever return to the franchise in Breath of the Wild. Link's sister in the Wind Waker was literally the inspiration for the concept art of Link's sister in Breath of the Wild. Countless times, I've considered this game to be the inseparable opposite to Twilight Princess. It's a duo of games where you can't have one without the other. You can't have a bright game like The Wind Waker without a dark game like Twilight Princess. You can't celebrate Ocarina of Time Legacy in one timeline without the other timeline. You can't go asking for one HD remaster to come to the Switch without asking for the other remaster. With unique gameplay, great music, great story, and an amazing world to explore, I will also give The Wind Waker the rank of A. Next week's review will remain a mystery. You can spend the whole week looking up in speculation about what this next Zelda game will be. Thank you for watching. See you next week.